And you're very welcome to the RT Rugby Podcast after Leinster scraped past Munster at Townham Park last weekend. And Andy Farrell has named his Ireland squad for the Six Nations. Delighted to be joined by Donald Lennon, Bernard Jackman and Wesley Liddy, as always. Gents, you're welcome. And Donald, I guess, look, let's just start off with the, the weekend that was, if you don't mind. Did you enjoy the game at Townham Park? I wasn't envious of you as I was sitting in front of the fire when you were sitting there in the freezing cold stadium. Did you get anything to warm the heart over 80 minutes of that match? Uh, well, I tell you, I enjoyed it obviously a little bit more than you did. I was watching your tweets, easy <laughs> view, sitting up in Wicklow. To, uh, I, uh, look, it wasn't a classic game, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was incredibly intense. Uh, the opening 20 minutes, Munster played uh, at a higher level than we've seen them for some time in this fixture. They were in control of the match. Um, but, you know, as we're, uh, obviously we'll talk about it, they didn't put Leinster away in that period. They were on top. They left the door open. Their line-out fell apart. Uh, obviously, the kicks again uh, that JJ missed proved crucial. But Leinster, like like all champion sides, like Saracens would do, if you leave the door open for them, well, then they're going to hurt you. And that's exactly what they did. So, um, But as a contest, I enjoyed it. I, I, I fully accept it wasn't uh, uh, the opening flowing rugby. I mean, the, the amazing thing for me is it's the third... Um, venture of this game since last August and the first one if you remember 27-25 when players hadn't played for four or five months that was probably the most entertaining of them Um, which maybe goes to show that uh, when you haven't much training done and you haven't much structure done you get a better match so who knows well, I, I was like a kid before Christmas too, Bernard Jackman. But the problem was that I woke up and Santa left me a bag of coal and one of Rudolph's leftover eaten carrots. So I just didn't find it entertaining at all. Maybe I was asking for too much. Uh, maybe I, I expected too much. But as a spectacle for me, uh, and again, I can appreciate that the hard grinds and the, the, the close physical battles and all that. I can appreciate all that. For, a spectacle for me, it was just a damn squid. Yeah, you must have been a good boy last year, Hugh. Uh, Santa didn't give it what you want. But look, at I think... It was never going to be a free-flowing game. The conditions, you know, we saw the snow came in beforehand. Um, there's, It's always going to be cagey because both teams are absolutely focused on just getting the points. And uh, while Munster, you know, showed elements of, of improvement in their attack, that Leinster defence is hard to break down. And, um, you know, I, I thought last week, you know, it was Munster's defence against Leinster's attack. And I think if you ask Munster last week, you know, do they need to score, keep Leinster 13 points? You, you know, you fancy to win the game, that they'd be very frustrated with their inability to be able to pressurise Leinster into more ill discipline or or get that second try. And and um, I think Munster are getting closer. Um, but the argument would be from a Leinster point of view is that they didn't really fire in all cylinders, they didn't come into the game, you know, with the cohesion because of Christmas and things like that. And yet they still found. I think Leo Cullen going back up the road and Stuart Lancaster. Um, are going to be happier that they still have, you know, Munster's number without maybe playing really well because of this mental strength and, and trust that they had in each other that they were going to get one shot. And the chance, the reality is, you know, they shouldn't have had that that one shot. Um, you know, Munster let a brilliant kick from Connor Murray, you know, gives Leinster Lyon outside their 22. And, and just the, the sequence of errors from there that led to the try will just absolutely drive, you know, Munster mad. And and, and then, you know, they're one point up with, with whatever, 10 minutes to go. And uh, Ross Byrne kicks the kick from the conversion, which you know really forces Munster to have to score a try, which is you know it's it's brilliant from Ross Byrne to have your sub kicker come on and, and nail that, and obviously the the role he played in the try. So I, look, I thought it was a, a tight game. I thought it was fascinating um, seeing the the matchups, and yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I, I think you're wrong. And look, sorry, it's your own opinion. I, I certainly enjoyed it. Yeah, well, okay. I hate having to rely on Wes Liddy to back me up here. Wes, are you going to be the one who who actually agrees with me on this one about the spectacle no, that was? No, no was, I didn't think so. Didn't um, think so. Yeah. Uh, no, look, I thought I thought it was one of the most the games I've seen most so far that a, a crowd there would have taken it to a whole other level because um, it was that sort of a fixture. You've been I reading Jerry Thorne in Irish Times a bit. <laughs> I, look, I see what you're saying. It, like there, there wasn't a huge amount of free-flowing rugby. I thought there was some quality in attack. There, the Troy mainly, and a few bits from Jordan Larmer. I thought Robbie Henshaw was very sharp in attack. Um, but I, I just thought it was it was very physical. It was a great tune-up for fellows going into Irish camp. Um, I think ultimately, individual errors, um, stupid mistakes, um, and, and, and kind of their attack not quite being where they're hoping to get it to 
was the difference in the side. I think Leinster just ultimately had a, a bit more composure and a bit more belief and maybe that's to be expected from a team where you have 10 or 12 players with 30 caps under their belt. Right, okay. Well, just, okay, Donald, just to break it down. I, and, and here, look, I'm not being facetious here. You know, obviously, the, the, both sets of teams gave it their all, right? But what I was looking for was something from the best of Irish rugby, largely, that would excite me ahead of the Six Nations, that we can break down an English defence, that we can break down a French um, a defence and equally uh, cope with a, a very strong French attack. And I, that's what I was looking for. And in the concept of the game itself, I can appreciate, obviously, it was an arm wrestle. There was facets to it that were very uh, interesting. But I just didn't see a whole lot that would enthuse me from an Irish bunch of players going into the Six Nations. And that's my standpoint coming from this. Yeah, well, I think you, you're going to be very disappointed watching the Six Nations then. If you listen to any of the coaches at international level, you see the way international rugby is going. Um, given the change in the way the, the uh, interpretation of the law around the breakdown, there is no teams, certainly at international level, taking any sort of undue risks in their own half of the field. I mean, Eddie Jones has spoken about how influential the kicking game uh, is at international level. Uh, and we know that can be boring. Um, it's look, it, 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 Saturday night's game was never going to be about free-flowing attack and defences are so well organised now it's a game of chicken it's a game of, <clears throat> of risk um, games of that nature be it in the international or top provincial level they turn on small margins now for me Munster, Munster had all the early gains they had all the, the early momentum they actually in the opening 10 minutes of the game uh, they played with a huge amount of pace. They went wide early on a number of occasions. They had a quick first line out. Conor Murray had it in before Leinster were even set. Um, even, you know, I thought good innovation around the line out as well. I mean, the try, Ty Burns try came off uh, a five metre attacking line out. Leinster stayed on the ground in order to repel them all. Munster went off the top, so they, they counter bluffed them and they ended up scoring under the post. So, I mean, that's. Um, you know, that's what coaching and preparation is about. You look at the opposition, you see how you, you know, what are they going to do to you? How can you counter where, where they are going to be strong? I mean, this utopian dream that you're going to go out and move the ball wide and uh, look at line speeds in defence, particularly in those conditions. Um, I mean, the sleet and the snow early on was horrendous. I mean, it is grand for you sitting in your little uh, <laughs> with your fire on in your apartment. I mean, you're standing out in the wing. Jordan Lammer got pilloried and, and uh, you know, he, he kind of murries. Some of his box kicking were absolutely inch perfect. You're standing out in the wing in those conditions. You might not have seen the ball for 10 minutes. It's kind of difficult, you know. Um, yeah. And that's the way the modern game is. The, like we've seen England in particular, and I'm not advocating for a minute, I hope, um, uh, the, the Six Nations doesn't go this way but England in that Nations Cup were a team that were more comfortable without the ball than with the ball they put you under pressure for you to make mistakes and unfortunately whether we like it or not we'd all love to see free-flowing rugby um, you know the, the French the way the French and to be fair France um, are playing differently to others and I know maybe next week we'll be focusing more on the Six Nations and that will be a topic for discussion but, uh, you know, I think you were, ex like, if that was your expectation, then I think you were in dreamland before the game started. Well, I, I don't think it's unfair to expect, you know, uh, <laughs> 30 I players. I over. You're wrong, Hugh. God no, 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 no. And, then, and again, like, again, like I said to you, I can, I can appreciate that the, the, you know, the intricacies of a hard-fought game under under what were less than ideal conditions. But can any one of you there tell me, like, were there two or three line breaks that stood out over the course of 80 minutes? Sorry, hold on a while. Is there yeah. any reason you're unwilling to show your face on this thing? Come on, you've got to come out behind this blanket <laughs> at some stage. Listen, nobody wants you know? to see my face, right? I think that's... <laughs> but, like, you know, I guess, OK, you know, Bernard, let's take the game as a whole. If I, I was talking to, you know, a couple of lads saying, right, give me two or three line breaks that you remember there that were actually of, of, of consequence and they were struggled to do that. I'm not asking for, like, Helter Skelter, Harlem Globetrotters rugby, but I do think there's more... In, in both sets of players than perhaps we saw the other night. And I, I, I know the defences come on top. I know Eddie Jones plays a certain brand of rugby and he's unashamedly um, you know, proud of that. But I do think there's another way. France may be leading the way. And I think there's more in this Irish uh, bunch of players than we saw on Saturday night. Yeah, I think that, that both teams open up when they're allowed. But uh, I, I think the problem is, you mentioned there, both defences are, are very strong. I mean, Leinster tried to get the ball into the 
into the wider channels um, early in the game, and that that up 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 and in defence from from Munster just just shut it off. And you know, actually, it, Munster will be disappointed how to let ring rows and Henshaw duck back under and actually get back over the gain line. I mean, if Daly came up um, hard and inside, it would have caught him behind the gain line. But that's all Leinster could do. It wasn't that he didn't have the ambition to uh, to go there. It's literally the defence was was on top and and yeah and you either go around them or through them and or you go to the air and, and I think the, the both teams tried to mix it up as much as they could. I mean Leinster didn't have the ball for the first 20 minutes and I thought Munster's attack had lots of variety in it but they weren't getting the line breaks and the tries that maybe you wanted but um it is hard to break these teams down and and that's just the way it is at the moment. Defense is on top um and when you go up against two teams who have very well organized very committed defenses it does become a little bit of a, a battle of the gain line and a battle of tactics. Um, and I think that's what we saw. And I think I certainly found found it interesting how how Munster tried to, you know, target Leinster, as, as Donald, Donald said, a little bit differently, but also how Leinster stayed in the game, didn't let him get away from it. The key moments, you know, 40 minutes, ball hits off the post to have the the belief to uh, an organisation to go up and get, make the game 10-6 at half time. Now, I know Munster play into that with the, with a tackle from Marshall, but just yeah, I I I I don't mind when there's two teams with very good defenses, to be honest, because I think then you see you find out more about teams. I think you find out more about Munster and Leinster in that game than you did in some of the Pro 14 games so far when they have had 20 line breaks. You know? Right. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And and look, we're gonna move on to the Six Nations squad in a second. But like Wes, what was your main takeaway from the game? Um was it that Munster let the opportunity slip and Van Graan would be kicking himself? Was that Leinster once again found a way to win despite not having, I guess, the, the rub of the green for most of the match? What was your main takeaway from the match? Probably, probably a bit of both. Um, I think from, from a Munster positive point of view, they probably brought a level of belief and a level of aggression. It sounds funny to say it, but that they hadn't brought to this fixture in a while. And I think they actually got at least parity, if if not shaded the battle up front a bit. Um, I think someone like Gavin Coombs was extremely impressive in, in what was one of his kind of first big kind of fully loaded derby fixtures. Um, Ty Byrne was obviously very impressive as well. So uh, positives for them there. But I think like Birch hinted at it there, aside from the attack, and actually you could say their tactics and the tactics they employed in that, dour fixture in the semi-final a few months ago were actually vindicated that they got so much joy again out of targeting that Leinster back three under the high ball. It was just when they got their advantage from that at that point I agree you'd like to see them be a little more constructive in attack with it but I suppose they'll point to the Thanks. fact that their try, try came from a series of uh, one-out runners so um, look there was positives there but, but ultimately They'll definitely feel they shot themselves in the foot for for Leinster. I think, look, you got to hand it to them for for staying in there, for staying composed, and for just having that touch of quality when when it came when it came to it and when it was needed. And that's what's separating the two teams at the minute. They just have that slight edge. Okay, so that was sorry, Hugh. Just Hugh. before you go on, sorry. Yeah. I mean, the, the 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 other key thing for me, I think, is is psychologically, I think Leinster know they have the measure of Munster. So therefore, they're actually quite comfortable in absorbing pressure for long periods, knowing that their opportunity is going to come, knowing that in the past when Munster have come within, uh, you know, that a couple of points of, of closing out the game, they haven't been able to do it in this particular fixture. Um, I mean, they did it against Claremont uh, away in, in un incredibly difficult circumstances, but there's a, there's a, a high percentage of those, as particularly the younger Leinster players, who've either never lost to Munster or maybe have lost once in the seven or eight times that they've played against them. And that kind of plays at the back of your mind. So like outside of all the, the rugby aspects of it, psychologically, I think Leinster just have that edge there at the moment. Yeah, Birch? Yeah, I, I agree with that. that was the point I was going to make. I think, you know, we said, I actually think in terms of the, the content of rugby-wise, defence, attack, breakdown... Um, uh, kicking game, etc. There was actually very little between them. It was, it was two, you know, goal kicking and ill discipline. You know, unforced um, penalty, like when they weren't under huge pressure, just had a little bit of composure that Donald said Leinster have. 
that's all the Munster are missing now to to get over, you know, to be able to beat Leinster. I'm not saying they're better than them, better than them, but to be able to beat them um, once and then obviously from that gain confidence. Yeah. But realistically, you know, they, they need to take every point that's an offer and not give Leinster soft soft penalties around the halfway mark when Leinster weren't really going anywhere. I think, Bert, sorry, it'll annoy them as well, given that Munster, I think, uh, uh, statistically had the best line out coming into yeah. the competition. I mean, they had four line outs in, in strong attacking positions and blew them plus one crooked throw. I mean, that is a massive turnover in an area of the game that you, you know, you launch an awful lot of your attacks off that a lot of your scores come from. Um, yeah. And you work so hard to get into that position and then you blew it. Um, yeah, I so I, I think that that was a huge the, factor. The same well. on the other side of the ball, Donald. In terms of if you think of some of Ty Burns, you know these fantastic steals on the goal, goal line, huge morale boost. You kick to the you kick to touch, and then you lose your own line out, and you give Leinster a, a launch pad just outside your twenty two again. So, like a real release in the pressure valve on both sides of the field just from the line out to loan, but something that should be fixable at the same time. I think they seem yeah. to struggle with that second row pairing in terms of, of calling line outs, maybe. And I, I don't know, maybe Snayman's return fixes it a bit. Right, but in the, in the context of second row then, Laz, and in the context of Andy Farrell's Ireland squad, so we'll, we'll come back to, to Casey and Tom O'Toole as the two debutants in it and whether overall the squad is as you would have expected. But let's just focus on Ty Byrne for a minute, Donald, because... He had a brilliant game, um, you know, all over the park. And I'm wondering now, has he done enough, you know, to put his hand up to Andy Farrell and say, look, I deserve to be your starting second row for the Six Nations alongside James Ryan. Has he done enough in your view? I think he has. Um, a straight answer to a straight question. I mean, I thought he was excellent in the autumn series. He played in a couple of those games. Um, in the last two, two outings, he's been absolutely outstanding. You know, there is the debate. Uh, you know, he's he's not quite as, as bulky as other players. But um, uh, I think, you know, when you look, obviously there'll be some, if you're playing South Africa in the morning, for argument's sake, would you be happy to play Ty Byrne and James Ryan? Probably not. Um, so therefore, there is an element of, you know, you have to take the opposition into consideration when you're selecting your side. Um, I think, he, uh, you know, the debate hasn't been answered since he's come home. Is he better at six or is he better in the second row? Uh, a lot of his uh, top-class rugby for the Scarlets, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think was played out of the back row as opposed to the second row. Um, but I think he has the skill set um, to, to, to play in the second row. I've no doubt about it. Um, and for the opening game against Wales, in the context, like I'm a huge fan of Ian Henderson, have been for years. Um, we, we've spoken on this forum in the past about, you know, he's he, he does lack sort of consistency in a game. He goes in and out, but he, he he certainly is a bigger physical brute. But again, you have this question mark, as you have with a lot in the squad, and we'll talk about the squad, the concern that I would have. There's a lot of players in there who are lacking serious game time. Uh, so therefore, you've got to balance that when you're selecting your side as well. So on that basis alone, I, I certainly wouldn't have any issue with picking Ty Byrne and James Ryan for the game against Wales. And, you know, Ty, you know, Ty Byrne, um, just to pick up on Donald's point there, Bernard, you know, one of the criticisms, not the criticisms, I guess, you know, one of the, the stones you can throw at him is that he's not this physical freak of an athlete um, that second rows traditionally might be. But I'm looking at, like, you know, Mario Tojri is an incredible athlete. He's, he's not the biggest guy in the world. You look at, like, New Zealand, like, White Lock, and, like, the second row that, that we used to have, the back he's bought the types and whatever, I wonder, you know, has the, the position changed a little bit that it is, it is there to accommodate more players like Ty Byrne who aren't just physically freaks, but they can get around the pitch more. And will you not fit, fit in well into that mold? Uh, look, I think if you have one, a backies border type of Paul Billums, uh, which France have, you, yeah. but if we don't have anyone of, of, of that profile. And, and I, I rate Henderson as well, but I'm not sure how much better he is than Ty when Ty is in top form. And particularly Henderson's come back from injury. Um, so I'd have no worries about playing him against, against Wales. I think, um, he's a form choice and, and and the way the rules have gone or the interpretation of the breakdown has gone he's suddenly his strengths are are completely back in um in fold and, and like you know the, the amount of penalties Munster are able to get that possession you're getting particularly on your going goal line to have someone who's able to get in there and and, and affect change on the rook or, or get a turnover is massive because you know against the big teams you very rarely get the ball back it's usually five points so um, I would I would pick him to be honest, and I, and I think he 
you know, we, we didn't see him in the open field and he's very good there as well. So he's a, he's a really good athlete in his own right. He's just not a, you know, a big, massive, you know, scrummage and tight head lock. That's all. Um, but he's, he's certainly a good athlete. And uh, yeah, I, I think he deserves a crack. What do you think, Wes? He's definitely done enough. He's definitely earned his place to answer your first question. But, you know, that's why I think when people talk about are things selected on form is, is a little bit of a misnomer because it's not only form that has to go into it, but... I think to expect Ty Byrne to get the results he got the other night at the breakdown in a game against England or France or South Africa, as Don said, is, is unrealistic because he doesn't have the, the physical abilities to, to play that kind of role against him. But would I worry about him starting against Wales? No. But ultimately, I don't know, maybe his, his best impact would be off the bench um, against those bigger sides. Maybe it would be at six, but... Uh, you're looking around at Henderson, Delan, I would put into this category, Ryan Baird, I would put into this category, who is disappointed not to see him kick on and make the squad. But there is a few guys with kind of that bring different and, you know, highly prized physical attributes. And I'd like to see us find the best use of those going forward um, in terms of a combination and in terms of, of maybe tweaking what we do a little bit to, to um, you know, to facilitate them, them using their, their skill set. Yeah, yeah, but just, just sorry, well, Hugh, like look at the Irish pack that we think play against Wales, or, or certainly if you don't pick uh, Henderson the second, or sorry, if you don't pick uh, Ty Byrne, if you only have one jackal threat, and that's Peter Manny. Like, that's not the way the game has gone. Um, and so I think if you look at the profile of everybody else, if you had, you know, a six, so I'm presuming standard play six, you know, if you had a six who was a real jackal threat, um, well, potentially then you could carry a different profile somewhere else. But the team I think will start at the forwards, I think it'll start, you know, you only have Peter Manny, who's a jackal threat, which, you know, isn't really picking a team to to exploit the way the rules are are, are being refereed, or the game's being refereed at the moment. Mm, and then maybe that opens up other questions as well. But just overall, Donald, your, your thoughts on the squad, um, you know, does, we asked, I asked on, on Twitter <coughs> last night for a few questions and, you know, we got a couple along the same lines saying, like, like, is this a form selection here or is Andy Farrell just reverting to type with guys coming back into the squad, a lot of whom have played very little rugby over the last a couple of months? Is he selecting on form here? Uh, look, it's, it's uh, I think when you're going into something like the Six Nations with very, you know, they haven't, uh, they haven't been together since that autumn series. Coaches tend to pick the tried and trusted, but... Uh, you'll always pick a couple of springers, for example, Craig Casey coming into the squad. And look, it's a 36-man squad, so it gives you huge um, scope. Uh, so from that point of view, I, you know, like personally, I'd have been disappointed that Gavin Coombs and Ryan Baird hadn't been it. Um, but uh, I, I, it's a funny squad from the point of view that we've only named two loose heads. And one of those, Dave Kilcoyne, has played little or no rugby for the past couple of months. Yet, uh, we've picked five second rows and we've picked five centres. Um, if you consider Peter Romani, and I think Peter Romani will start with seven on his back, then we've three sevens as well. So it's a little bit of a, a lopsided selection for me in a number of areas. And I would have concern. I mean, are we saying by picking only two loose heads, one of which is, is Dave Kilcoyne, who certainly deserves his goal. But as I say, if Kean Healy got injured in the first five minutes of the game against Wales, uh, has Dave Kilcoyne the, the gas to play 70 minutes? Uh, maybe there's talk about uh, Andrew Porter covering loose head as well. But bear mm. in mind then you have Ty Byrne on the tight head side who hasn't played since the 23rd of February. So are we now... Ex- and, and the workload that's been placed on Andrew Porter right through the autumn series for Leinster in their big games, if you then expected him to cover loose head as well, I think that's a massive gamble. So, you know, there's a lot of... Um, issues that I'd be concerned about with the squad from that point of view. Yeah, and the Andrew Porter covering and covering loose head is, <clears throat> is interesting. Bernard, there are some who s- still say that, you know, he should be an out-and-out loose head and that him and, and Tyg Furlong should be our, our starting front row. But is it a gamble, do you think, like Sir Eric O'Sullivan hasn't made it? Yeah, this is, it makes absolute Look, at the front row, I'm glad Donald brought it up. The props makes no sense to only have five, five props. Tom O'Toole is a player for the future. I mean, if Tom O'Toole had to start tight head uh, in a Six Nations game, we'd be worried. Anyone who watched him play against Leinster A uh, or two weeks ago knows he's a project. He's um, he's going to be a great player, but he's just not ready to... He's not really ready to play uh, 
top European Cup will be as a scrummager. So I think he's in there for experience. So effectively, we've gone with four props, um, realistically, who are proven at international level. And as Donald said, Ty Furlong hasn't played a game. Um, and, you know, they're obviously, you know, they're tracking his fitness and maybe he's going to come in um, and um, blow the house down. But, like, realistically, there's a chance of another setback with, with, with that. Uh, the fact that Porter would have to go across and also the fact they're in a, a bubble um, does make it harder to move people in and out. So I, I don't see, I don't see why they would limit themselves to to four and a half prop decisions. Um, and also, like if you look what England has done, Eddie Jones is called a shadow squad. I forget about the name. All that means is that those, he's picked twenty eight in his main squad, and then a shadow squad of twelve. Those twelve are are subject to the same uh, bubble conditions and, and testing conditions as the twenty eight. So effectively, he just has a much more fluid process of, of bringing somebody from the shadow into the main main squad. And like, I, I, I don't know what the need was to go uh, so light on, on front rows. And even in terms of, of, of scrummaging and training and everything like that, you're just, you know, it's very rare that there's not a front row who has a knock and can't scrum on a Tuesday, you know, and it's just, it doesn't make sense. It, it's a really bizarre one um, on, on that alone. And, and I just wanted to make sure that we, we cover that because I do think it's a, it's a big risk. It is a big risk, Wes. And look, you know, looking at Eddie, Eddie Jones, and you know, he's he's his sound bites are great sometimes, and he winds everybody up. But I just get the sense you're watching Eddie Jones. What absolutely hammers across from Eddie Jones is control. He has complete control of the setup and the squad in the English camp. He knows exactly what he's doing. I don't. I'm not sure that Andy Farrell inspires the same confidence. Yeah. Um... Just, just quickly to go back to the props thing, it kind of jumped out at me obviously yesterday when the squad was selected. But when you actually break it down, as Bernard did there, it's 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 actually incredible, really. Like when you think of someone like Finley Beelham that can play both sides, not making the, the squad, um, Ty Furlong not being fit at the minute, um, and and Tom O'Toole as inexperienced as he is, it's it's bizarre, really, but. Yeah, I suppose on the Eddie Jones thing, he he does have he definitely does have control within the squad. But I suppose on the flip side, he's uh, he's desperate for control of that narrative uh, in the wider public and in the media as well. And I don't know, there's there's a slight bit of the kind of Jose Mourinho uh, type fatigue now for me with him kicking in at this stage. It's every year, every time you go into camp, it's it's the latest kind of you know where's he going to go next? Some people love it. Some people get a bit bored of it, I suppose, with the resources he's had at his disposal in terms of a player pool and finance. There was one goal for him and, you know, it was a lofty goal in terms of winning the World Cup, but he, he didn't quite get there. But it doesn't seem to have, uh, it doesn't seem to have shaken his confidence anyway. Um, he's still getting results. Well, he's, he's, getting, he's getting a lot of results. I mean, they won the, the, the Autumn Cup. They won the Six Nations, the World Cup final. Um in fairness, like he's not on the perform- Okay, yeah, they potentially could have won the World Cup, but I can't. It's hard to say, whether you like him or not. You can't say that they're underperforming. No, like I, I wouldn't winning, say, I maybe not the style, but winning. Their, their performance against New Zealand, I think, in the semi final was probably the best performance by any side over the last four or five years. Um, so yeah, it's harsh to judge someone on one game, but. When he was so bullish about it all, he I'm just saying he has a brass neck to keep coming yeah. out with pronouncements the way that he does. I, t- really. <clears throat> I tell you what he has, Wes. He knows exactly what he's doing. He has a short-term plan. He has a long-term plan, but he has a short-term plan working side by side with that. By that, what I mean is he's willing to take um, a, a step backwards at certain points because he knows it will aid England's development in the longer term. I go back to the game against Georgia, if you might remember, England-Georgia. He just scrummaged the whole night. He had a specific focus on that game, and he was doing that for a reason. You look at, the, if, if you look where England are now, the age profile of their squad with young fellas like Curry and Underhill and, 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 and others, come next World Cup, They'll, they'll have, you know, they'll only be 27, 28, 29 with a, a huge amount of caps. Um, he also, I think, in terms of the way he... Alex Ferguson lasted for 20-plus years with Manchester United. And one of the main reasons he was able to do that is he constantly changed and tweaked his coaching and his management group. Uh, it is only when you step back and you look like... Uh, um, 
it was only I was watching that uh, Chasing the Sun, the South African um, uh, docu- brilliant documentary on the World Cup. And you look at how big a role Matthew Proudfoot had as the forwards coach in that particular group. He's plucked him out of, out of South Africa and he's with England now. I mean, what a massive um, plus that is for your group, bringing in a fella of his standing. They've just won a World Cup in the background and it's almost forgotten. He has John Mitchell, who's coached the All Blacks. And he, like he's his defence coach. So Eddie Jones, can he can afford to play these mind games at times. But with me, and you know, I've, I've come across him a number of years ago when he was in Australia. He's an annoying figure at times. He'd drive you bananas. But he's always working towards an end goal. Whereas with Ireland and, and, and Andy Farrell at the moment, I'm not sure I can see that end goal. Do you know what I mean? You look at the squad we have, there is actually very little change from the last World Cup. We could end up with a backline starting of Conor Murray, Johnny Sexton, uh, Gary Ringrose, um, Robbie Henshaw, Keith Earls. Um, and no, I'm not saying all of those deserve to be selected. And if I was picking the, the team, I'd be selecting those five players. But do you know what I mean? We're, we're, we're not... Uh, where is the involvement? Of yeah, where but don't, this, this, is, this is my point about Johnny Sexton. Johnny Sexton will be 38 in the next World Cup. What are we doing sticking with an out half who will be 38 come the next World Cup? Conor Murray will be 34. Peter Armani will be almost 34. Like, I, I don't see, uh, you know, any, you're absolutely right about Eddie Jones. Bringing in uh, players, he has a plan, he knows exactly what he's doing. I'm looking at this Ireland squad pick today, right? And, I, and I'm saying to myself, like, what's what's the plan for two and a half years' time here? What Where are the guys coming through that come two and a half years' time will have 30 caps, will have 40 caps? And I don't see it. I do not see it. And particularly in our key positions, I know Casey's been brought in there, and that's great. I hope he gets a run. He probably won't get a run in the Six Nations. Um, it'll be Gibson Park and Murray for most of it. Johnny Sexton as well. Where's our next out half coming from? I know Joey Curry's back training. I mean, I, I just don't see what the plan is for two and a half years. And when we go to this World Cup, like we were the last time, we had a 39-year-old captain. We had, you know, a, a fullback who was probably three or four years past his best. When we go to the next World Cup and we're all scratching our heads saying, well, why aren't we playing? It's because we have not invested in, in, in young players when we needed to, to sacrifice some games in the Six Nations, to get guys caps, to get guys experience. And this is my whole problem uh, with this kind of, with the squad that he's picked here. Yeah, but in fairness, like compared to Eddie Jones, I mean, I agree, I agree with you, but we do have four professional teams to pick from, and he is slightly beholden <coughs> to who's getting opportunities at provincial level. Now, you could argue the whole point of that system is that they can ensure certain people get opportunities. So, but at the same time, it's very hard to parachute a guy in that hasn't built up some amount of experience at, at, at Pro 14 level. So, I don't think it's comparing like with like with the English situation by any means. Um, but I'll, I'll be honest, I mean, I hate saying it, but the likes of Paul O'Connell committing to that Irish coaching ticket would be something I would take a lot of confidence from in terms of what I mean by that is it, it's, it's only really when you see guys like O'Connell and other very senior players speaking so highly of Andy Farrell that, that fills you with confidence because the evidence so far of the tenure wouldn't fill you with confidence that, as you say, that there is a clear destination in mind. Darren, yeah, yeah go on. Yeah, yeah no, just for me, uh, like, I'm not questioning him at all. I'm just questioning this selection. And I think um, I think if you're, a, if you're a player who's out of this squad, you know, the, the message it sends is that form isn't really important and, that, and that's that's a dangerous road to go down or, or else you go down that road and, and the players back you and and they, they bounce back into form an international camp and also in terms of this policy of you know um game time leaving your pro home province to go get game time you know this this squad doesn't um doesn't show that game time is important that you you can start is sub for for leinster or munster and still make the squad which again is a is an interesting one because that wasn't really the message that that was was going around for the last couple of years. So if you're if you're John Cooney or you're you know Jack Carty, you know, and you see you know Ross Byrne or or, or James Gibson Park, or if you're if you're um, uh, McGrath, Luke McGrath, who's got ahead of James Gibson Park the last seven or three or four weeks uh, at Leinster, you know, you're going, what, how do I get back in the, in the team? That's just just something that we can definitely question um, or, or ask the question around 
around this. Is it going to be a squad based on form or is international? Um, and I know I know that Reese Ruddock is on form, and I, and I don't disagree with Craig Casey getting in there. I think he, he's he's looked really sharp and bright. But I'm just saying, it's just mixed messages for players is going to be important. Um, so if you're out of this squad now, you know what's the message to to go to one, like part <clears throat> for your problems? You don't have to be very good every week. Yeah, and, I, yeah, and I, I also think, sorry, there, there, there's different ways of building an international squad. Um, and you, you're absolutely spot on in, in, in terms of we only have four squads to pick from. Eddie, Eddie Jones can mix and match a little bit more and he can have that long-term plan because he has so many players at his disposal. Um, I mean, or the fact that we have only teams has been our strength in that we can build up the number of caps that players have over a period of time. You look at, uh, again, it was only sort of looking at that documentary on the World Cup and uh, Wales, you, you've forgotten just how, how well Wales played. They were within three points of beating South Africa in the semi-final of the World Cup. I mean, mm-hmm. you talk about farm, Bircher, you talk about the Welsh districts during Warren's Gatlin's time were an absolute disaster, and they still are a disaster. They like they've never won a, a, a Champions Cup. Uh, you have to go back to the Ospreys a number of years ago to have a, a Pro 12 or Pro 14 victory. But Gatland had a different chemistry in terms yeah. of the way that he went about. He had tried and trusted players that he knew he'd get a response from the minute they come into international camp. Wales are slightly different as well in that they're making up the districts. Are, you know, you didn't grow up wanting to play for the Ospreys or for the Dragons, but you grew up in Wales and the only jersey you wanted was the red jersey. So they have a different mindset. So there's no one right way. You've got to cut your cloth to suit your, um, to suit your resources. Um, and Eddie Jones and Razi Erasmus are in a different, and obviously New Zealand, given their strength and depth, have a different... Um, approach and a different capability of building an international squad that we have. Um, but the, the, the one concern, as I say, I do have with this squad is the lack of the opportunities for the younger players, plus in Ty Furling, Dave Kilcoyne, Ian Henderson, James Lowe, Andrew Conway. That's five players with little or no rugby over the last um, six, seven, eight weeks. So, but sorry, there is different ways and means of going yeah. about building your international squad. Just on the Sexton one, Hugh, I know you're always looking to address that and we probably skirt around it, but like if you look at Saturday night's game, like I wrote down after 15 minutes that Sexton had been invisible and anonymous to that point, but you look at how we came into it, how vocal he got after that, how he directed things. Like I accept your point that he'll be 38 in two years, but I mean, who who else would you feel confident with starting a Six Nations game with, with, with any real conviction that you're going to get a result? Well, I'll tell you what, we have no idea because we haven't seen enough of the of the, of the guys underneath him. And like, I'm not being facetious here. I know, I know, hang on, but no, but I'm talking about, okay, well, hang on a sec. No, don't, I, I'm not trying to dismiss Johnny Sexton here. I, that's not what I'm saying at all. I know he's still our best out half. My point is that... Like, if we keep playing Jonathan Sexton, we'll never find out whether the guys underneath them are up to the standard. I mean, that's, like, that's well, my issue will. here. And, like, will. I've, looked at, I've looked at Sexton over the, last, over the last season and a half, the amount of times he has finished the game or gone off after 45, 28, 24, 24, 77, 56, 45, 59 minutes. And it's a long, long list. And I'm saying, even if he is our best fly half at the moment, which he, which he is... Like, you know, his track record of injury over the last two years is actually quite frightening when you look at it and his ability to, to stay injury-free. No question about that. Um, but to say that we don't know about the others, I mean, Ross Byrne has had a huge amount of opportunity at international level. Um, you know, he, he does look a different player coming on or starting with Leinster uh, than he's looked at international level. Um, Jack Carthy, uh, we've spoken about it again on this podcast. We see glimpses of brilliance from him. You go back to that uh, Connacht game against Leinster in, in, in the RDS when he was outstanding, uh, but he didn't back it up the following week. Um, is he uh, unlucky, Donald? Like, is he unlucky not to make the squad, do you think, Jack? Uh, I think he, yeah, I think he is. Uh, I think he, he, like, given that he was part of the squad in the World Cup, I think his confidence was shattered there. But maybe, maybe Andy Farrell has decided, having had him in the World Cup, that, look, he is not at the level 
that uh, I feel he needs to be at to play international rugby. So therefore, I'm, I'm looking at someone else. I mean, the bottom line is over the course of the last, since the World Cup, uh, Billy Burns has certainly looked the best of the rest. I think he, he probably started the November series as number three and finished uh, as number two. The only one of the issues surrounding Billy Burns is he's not the frontline place kicker with Ulster. John Cooney is. So therefore, when he comes on, he's is he kicking for Ireland when he's not a frontline kicker week after week? And we saw, certainly when looking at those monster games, you have to have the facility to have a kicker in the 80 to 90 percent range. Particularly if we're playing England and France in the morning, you've got to make sure you nail every kick. Um, so, you know, the, there are guys there that have got the opportunity. Unfortunately, again, we've said this numerous times on this podcast, Joey Carberry was the heir apparent um, and, and he hasn't played rugby in 18 months. Yeah. Just, and just, that, I, I, just you, I think Sexton is still unbelievably influential on and off the field. I, I think that, it, you know, him being on the field for the first until he got injured was was an important part of Leinster staying in the game, staying composed, getting you know getting themselves focused, kick two goals that he needed to kick, um, and also go back to the Scotland game, um, his last game for Ireland. I mean, he was very influential, and the fact he's gone off in a lot of games injured has given others opportunities. So they're, it's not like they're not, he's playing eighty minutes every week, and we're not getting to see anybody else. I mean, they will get their opportunities, um, and they just got to prove that they're better than him. But at the moment, he's still a key man for Ireland, whether he's going to be 38 at the next World Cup or not. And just, yeah, and sorry, I... just sorry, you, but the last, like the point that Wes was making, you know, taking his notes and looking at him the first 15 minutes of the game, Leinster didn't have any ball. <laughs> Very hard to be influential when you haven't the ball in your hand or you haven't seen the ball. Munster were on top in that opening 15 minute period. Uh, I think it shows more of your class that uh, the minute they got a little bit of possession, that he was in a position to influence where the game was played and how Leinster attacked. So, um, listen, it's up to the rest to come up and get up to his standard. And the bottom line is nobody has done that. Listen, as I said to Brian Driscoll on Twitter there the other night, what would you know? What would you know, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Paul Gustard, um, lads, before we move on um, uh, for this week, Paul Gustard has, has moved to um, Treviso as defence coach after leaving Harlequins, Birch. Um, it does seem, um, you know, the, the way he, in which he departed was... Uh, well, not ideal. Yeah. Um, what do you make of the whole story there? Look at um, he actually. So he went into Harlequins. They were tenth. Um, they got the fifth his first season. I think they finished sixth last year or uh, last season. Got to a, a final, a Premiership final. Looked to be making progress. The last probably block the Munster game um, in in Tolmond when they had an ill discipline. Uh, got well beaten at home by by Racing. Um, drew with London Irish. The results were starting to performance was starting to slip a little bit. Interestingly. And I, I don't know, there's two sides to this. So the CEO came out and kind of said, you know, gave a statement and said, oh, um, you know, he didn't really fit our culture and what we want to we want to um, create here. Um, well, he was he was offered a new contract uh, by that same CEO. Yeah. The only reason the deal wasn't done was he wanted things to change in the club. Um, and he was holding off because I think he felt to finish the job, he needed, you know, needed more change. Um, and th- the thing is, is and this is a, this is, What's interesting around clubs hiring coaches, they hired him to change the culture in Harlequins, right? So, and um, what he did in England, what he did in Saracens, and the, the the Harlequins culture or performance over the last ten years, you know, they haven't been um, Exeter or, or Saracens. They won one Premiership under under Connor, and um, apart from that, they haven't been you know top dogs, and they want to be top dogs, and they think they're top dogs. So they brought him in to change it, and obviously he felt he needed to make some drastic changes to, to be able to finish the job. And when the club were, weren't sure they're going to make those changes, um, he refused to sign a contract. Um, and then I think rumor is that the players then, you know, started to go to the club or the club and said, look at, you know, um, we won't stay if, if Cousy stays or whatever. So it kind of forced his hand a little bit, but so I think he's, he's probably better off out there to be honest. Um, and I think, Benetton looks like a, you know, it looks like a demotion, really. Uh, but maybe for him, having been at the, the cold face with England and working for Eddie Jones, trying to change the um, the whole setup in, in Harlequins as a head coach, maybe just going away to Italy, you know, working as a defence coach, getting that experience with his family to to live somewhere else and and, and um, maybe a break to a certain extent could be great for him. Like, by all accounts, he's a phenomenal coach and a great bloke. So, 
um, maybe just the wrong guy, or the right guy at the wrong time, or, or the wrong guy in, in, a, in a in a club that weren't suited to him. But uh, I, you know, the LinkedIn message, you know, I think there's no mm-hmm. need for that really. But I think the CEO started it. So just the background is, you know, he wrote a message saying, um, "Great to be in a club where everybody's aligned and, and players and, and coaches all have the same vision." Things, um, but in fairness, I think it was a reaction to the CEO kind of coming out and saying, "Oh, they made the decision that Paul wasn't the right guy." Well. I think that's down to the fact that he refused to sign a contract until he got the commitments that they that he needed. Yeah, and we don't see it too often in rugby, so I guess that's no. why it, it grabbed an awful lot well, of uh, attention. You, 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 you and I had two nights in Treviso there uh, a number of years ago, Ulster and Treviso, and uh, I think we fully understand if you're looking for a new start or somewhere <laughs> different. Listen, I feel, like, I feel like I need a new start after a round with you three fellas about rugby all day, not making a single inroad into any of my arguments. All my notes Show your face. Exactly. I, it'd be bright red from the ass kicking I just after been hammering over the last 45 minutes. That's pleasure as always. Um, great to talk to you. We'll be back next week, obviously, with more rugby. Uh, until then, take it easy.